Broadcasting live to the world now. It's Sheila Zielinski. The Sheila Zielinski Show. The only show to give you the truth behind the headlines, prophecy, and the deeper things of God. Now, here is your host, End Time Watchwoman, Sheila Zelinsky. Hi everyone, and welcome to this October 14, 2015 edition of the Sheila Zelinsky Show. I broadcast Monday to Friday, that's weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and on Saturdays at 11 p.m. Eastern Time on Worldwide Christian Radio and WINB, and that information is linked there on the Radio Show Archives tab at weekendvigilante.com. If you have not signed up for my podcast, do so by going to the website and clicking on that pink Podomatic button and do sign up for the podcast. There's a lot of new listeners and new listeners. If you have not picked up my book today, Green Gospel, do so. It's the grandest fraud of our era. That's greengospel.ca. And I highly recommend that you do pick up a copy today. And if you've already bought a copy, do go to amazon.com and fill out a book review. And do let me know what you think about the book. I'm getting a lot of feedback and it's very important that I do get feedback from you, the listener. I really do want to know how you like the book. I want to promote an incredible event that's coming up in Florida. That's Live Oak, Florida, November 13th, 14th, and 15th, Augusto Perez. I am going to get out there. I told Augusto I will duct tape myself to a Greyhound bus if I have to get out there. Live Oak, Florida, please do get out to that and let people know if they're in the Florida area. I know that the closest major center is Jacksonville, Florida. So please do plan to be at that. And finally, I just want to remind all the listeners that this show is 100% listener supported and 100% uncensored and unbiased. Please do support this ministry. There is a donate button there at weekendvigilante.com and there's also a mailing address there at weekendvigilante.com. I am very excited to bring on my guest today. You all know him from the Alberino Analysis from stevequail.com, Genesis 6 Giants, as well as True Legends. It is my pleasure to have back on Timothy Alberino. Tim, welcome to the program. It is always so good to have you on. Very kind of you to have me back on. Thank you. So, Tim, on October 10th, just a few days ago, the LHC, the largest machine in mankind's history, was fired off. First, I want you to get into what CERN is, not just its location and how it operates, but really the data collection and really why it was invented. Well, we can start off with the LHC, which is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the uh, primary uh, mechanism by which CERN is uh, conducting its research. The LHC, as you said, is in fact the largest, most complex, and most expensive machine ever devised by man that we know of, at least definitely in the modern era. It went into activation on the 10th of September 2008. Basically, it's an atom smasher. Yeah, the Large Hadron Collider is uh, it's a 17-mile-long ring of superconducting electromagnets. It's buried about 300 feet approximately. It varies in its depth, about 300 feet beneath the ground near the city of Geneva on the uh, French and Swiss border. And uh, the, uh, the magnets uh, are superconducting because they're chilled to temperatures that are colder than the void of outer space. And it, it, it in fact, generates a magnetic field that is uh, much stronger than that of the Earth's. In fact, at least 100,000 times stronger than that of the Earth's. So this is a very powerful, significant machine. And what the Large Hadron Collider is, is a proton accelerator. It accelerates proton particle beams 
to a velocity just under the speed of light, and then it smashes them together in specialized detector chambers. There's four of them. And the idea is um, the atoms that they're smashing together, they strip off the electrons and then they smash the protons. The subatomic particles that are uh, the constituents of those protons, that's really what they're after are those subatomic particles. And they're hoping to discover new particles. They're hoping to perhaps discover particles that may point to, that may indicate a multiverse or extra dimensions. According to CERN, by the way, CERN is the organization that operates the Large Hadron Collider. It began as a council in the 1950s, a European Council for Nuclear Research. Um, and then it, and it morphed into the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which we call CERN, although the acronym doesn't really fit um, and there's a whole deal behind that. So CERN is the scientific consortium, the international consortium operating in charge of the Large Hadron Collider, which is not the only collider that mankind has created. We have um, a handful of them at least. A couple of them are in the United States, but they're much smaller than the Large Hadron Collider. Well, Tim, do you find it really kind of interesting? I always kind of connect dots that the European Organization for Nuclear Research was actually founded the very same year that another group was founded in 54. Interesting, in Holland yet. Kind of interesting. Yes. The Bilderberg Group, I assume you're yes. referring to. <laughs> yes. The infamous Bilderberg Group, which um, has only recently come to light in the mainstream media. It's, it, was, it was denied for, for decades that it even existed. A very notorious group. So I, I don't think it's coincidence. I think they go hand in hand. Both of them are backed by the United Nations and uh, the European Union, and the both of them enjoy diplomatic immunity, both of those organizations, Bilderberg and CERN. Well, and it's also kind of interesting that CERN is also the birthplace of the World Wide Web. I mean, when you right. think about their main site having this very massive computer facility, it contains powerful data processing facilities. And what is it primarily used for? Well, data analysis. So, I mean, you can see there's really this history of a worldwide networking hub behind this, don't you? There is. Uh, they knew that they were going to be having to be dealing with very large amounts of data. They wanted to be able to communicate. The scientists wanted to be able to communicate, collaborate. So out of that was born the World Wide Web, which which has grown into obviously uh, the internet and CERN. I, it was news to me actually when I started doing this research on CERN that that was in fact the birthplace of the internet. And the internet is basically we've, and this is sort of off topic, but uh, the internet is, it's like the collective knowledge of the human race. Yes. So basically we've assembled through the internet because of what began at CERN not only the scientific data of each individual nation or organization, we, we now have information involving every facet of human life and knowledge is now accumulated on the internet. So the next step, what's coming next, and CERN is playing a hand in this as well, is the artificial intelligence that is coming online now that is accessing the internet and is operating through the internet and has that collective knowledge of the human race has access to it and um, it, it and people can reference the the Star Trek the Next Generation the character Data who was a, a android who who had the collective knowledge of the human race in his mind in his programming in his circuits and so there's a whole lot of things coalescing around what's happening at CERN. This is a topic that is so, it's so large in magnitude and has so many different connecting pieces and parts. And it's a very technical topic. And I don't want to pretend tonight that, um, that I understand all of the scientific angles on CERN. I want to direct people right away, in fact, to Anthony Patch, because that guy is the foremost researcher on CERN, in my opinion. But we can definitely talk about some of the occult stuff, which is the broader view of all of this. 
Well, you and I have talked before, Tim, about very malevolent machinations over the historical, when you look down through the periods. And, of course, these guys, the same eclectic mishmash of very malevolent folks have been propelling this technology right from, look at the serpent in the garden. You and I have talked about the Aztecs and the Incas and the Mayans and the cultures that used very dark technology for dangerous purposes. When you think about the theme, it's really always around knowledge. And I think about the tree of knowledge. So really, it's kind of interesting that we've come full circle with these same very non-benevolent characters. It is. And you have to ask the question, what is their end game? What is it that they're trying to achieve? And the answer to that question is almost unbelievable. In fact, quite literally, it's ludicrous what these people are trying to achieve. And there's, there's an end game. There's, there's a final objective. There's a prime objective. But leading up to that prime objective, there's all kinds of sub-objectives. There's, there's objectives that are not the prime objective that are, are minor objectives. And it's sort of like, um, it's like ascending a, a, a very tall stairwell. And each step they take is taking them to that prime objective. But in between, there are so many different conspiratorial things happening and again coalescing. It, it gets dizzying to track them all uh, because their prime objective is so unimaginably, as I said, ludicrous and unbelievable and futile. And I'll just, I'll just say it. Their prime objective is to overthrow the order of God, to dethrone the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus, and to enthrone their own man, their own governor, their own leader, who I believe the Bible refers to as the man of sin, the man of perdition, who will be given not only the authority of the earthly realms of the of the king, human kings but is also going to be given the authority of satan and that's what they're working towards and it's an extremely ambitious goal because it is nothing less than literal war with god because after all they just say well tim we just want to know what happened at the big bang i mean that's really their their big purpose in this, isn't it? Going back to where it all started. I mean, who bought the gas to run this machine, I guess, is the question. Uh -huh. But it's so interesting. What I find stunning, maybe a month or so ago, you saw this huge Hindu god of death that was displayed on the side of the Empire State Building, Kali, the Hindu god of the underworld. Then flash forward to what's parked outside of CERN, well, Shiva the Destroyer God and the Cosmic Dance of Destruction out there. And then you look at the acronym for CERN and you get into these Celtic deities, God of Death, Lord of the Underworld. That's a real theme here. Oh, it's purely coincidental. I'm sure that these underworld deities are selected for the mascots of these machinations, if you will. Well, you mentioned the objective, the surface, the superficial objective of CERN, uh, of, of what they're doing with the Large Hadron Collider, is to try and figure out what the universe is made of and how it all began at the Big Bang. Uh, that's what they say they're doing. And it's important for people to understand that that's what most, the vast majority of the scientists working at CERN believe they're doing. Um, there's no way, no way that the guys who are funding their work, in other words, the benefactors, believe in the Big Bang. They don't. Uh, they don't believe in the Big Bang at all. They're Luciferian, which means that they understand. They call who Christians refer to as God, um, the Father. They refer to him sometimes, most of the time, as Adonai. And he is supposedly the wicked one. He's, he's the one who, who imprisoned the minds of men who inhibited the growth of mankind, the intellectual, the philosophical uh, growth of mankind and the blossoming of civilization. And it was Lucifer, the bringer of light, Prometheus, who enlightened mankind, who stole fire from the gods, so to speak, and, and broke the shackles uh, of Adonai. And so they take, the, they take the, the story of the Bible and they literally turn it upside down. These are the guys who are the benefactors of the research that's happening. And I point out in my analysis, and it's an important fact for people to understand that most of the time, in most cases, scientists are just con consumed in their field of study. 
They're looking to have a successful career. They're looking to gain renown, um, to be um, applauded by their peers. And they're very, very focused. They're laser pin focused on a very specific arena in, in, into a very specific arena of science. And so that rarely are they seeing the big pictures of things. They've always been the tools in the hands of their benefactors uh, who are usually hidden, except for when you've got guys like the uh, the leaders of the Third Reich who were using the Nazi scientists uh, to develop weapons of war, uh, the atomic bomb, all kinds of uh, advanced aircraft, and the scientists knew full well who they were building this stuff for. And then, of course, you have uh, Joseph Mengele, who was just who who was the archetypical uh, mad scientist, experimenting, doing horrific uh, experimentation on uh, children and splicing twins together, cut, uh, cutting body parts off, and then splicing them together and doing all kinds of horrific things to human beings. So you have your occasional mad scientist, but. But usually scientists, as much as they're lauded, as much as they're praised in society, are actually very, can we say, close-minded to the big pictures, to the, to, to the grand scheme of things. And so I'm saying all that uh, to, to affirm that many of the scientists working at CERN, the vast majority, truly believe that their work that the purpose of their work is to try and discover what the universe is made of and what happened at the Big Bang. But regardless of whatever their designs are, or their desires, you have to look beyond them. You have to look to the benefactor. You have to look who is funding, who is benefiting, and why. And what are they wanting to do with the technology? And why are there uh, occult connections? And to wrap this up, uh, the Shiva statue, for example, you'll get the people, you'll get all kinds of uh, uh, people on the internet who will uh, and who have uh, mocked, for example, my analysis on CERN because I dared to mention the Shiva statue that they that they have, which was uh, donated by India's, uh, I believe, their Department of Energy. It was given to CERN as a gift. And Shiva, to them, is supposed to represent Shiva standing on this little demonic dwarf being that supposedly represents ignorance. And so triumph of knowledge over ignorance and that may be on its face and on, the, on a superficial level a true testament of what the administrators of CERN are seeing in, 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 that, uh, in that analogy. But you have to look behind the scenes. You have to look to the occult masters and the priesthood that's pulling the strings and funding everything and understand who they are and what it is that they want. To... It, it's just very interesting. Also, coterminous to all this, it's interesting that in Europe in 2014, there was these Hungarian artists, and they had these very ominous stage presentations where these artists designed these big, giant men, and the, these men were erupting from the depths of the underworld. And to me, it was like a witchcraft ritual is what it was. And we talked a little bit about the destroyer god there, but when you think about the occult connections and all the Luciferian connections in this, the Trimeriti, the Hindu Trinity, and the other gods that were in that little trio of trespassers, I mean, it's always about unifying religion, mythology, and physics. And one might ask, well, what are they trying to do here, Tim? Are they trying to rebuild a new and improved universe? Because Lord Shiva apparently destroyed the world to sort of reconstitute it, you'd think, well, what is it they're really saying here? Well, that's, that's if you dig deeper into Shiva, and this is the theme of many of the gods of the ancient world, is that they don't just destroy to destroy. Their destruction has a purpose, it has a design. They destroy in order to reconstitute, to reinstitute. And there's something that they're looking to reinstitute. What is it that the occult, what is it that the ancient world is always nostalgic about? It's what I refer to as the empire of the gods. It's the time when the gods mingled with men, when the gods brought civilization to men, uh, when the gods themselves were among us. And that's, that's called the golden age. So that's what they're trying to reinstitute. That's what they're trying to reconstitute, to resurrect, if you will. It, that's why it, it's so important for people to understand what the antediluvian world really looked like to banish this notion that we have in our minds of the world being in an excessively primitive state, 
before the flood of Noah. That's just not true. We had a vast amount of knowledge. Uh, we were operating, uh, in many cases, uh, the human race was oppressed and was under the dominion of entities that were not fully human, that were in possession of secret knowledge, that understood the fundamentals, uh, that understood science, what we call science. They're the ones that were there, uh, the B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God, that were there. They shouted for joy when the earth was created. They understand the mechanisms behind what we call physics and chemistry. And so we're dealing with a time in which these entities, in rebellion against God, in, the, in an act of insubordination, were among men, were among our race, teaching them things that they should not have known, things that were forbidden. And again, we generally call these things science today. And people say, well, you're anti-science. Well, no, not necessarily. There are things that are profitable to man, and then there are things that are not profitable to man. And when I say not profitable, I don't mean in a very cheap sense. I don't mean in a very temporal sense. In other words, um, it's not profitable because it doesn't, it doesn't really help us. It doesn't increase the comfort of our lives. I'm talking about it's not profitable in the sense that it will destroy us. It will lead to death and carnage and suffering. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of science that was prohibited. That's the kind of science that these fallen angels introduced, these, these entities in the Golden Age. They introduced the kind of science that would cause mankind to open a gate, to open a channel of communication with entities that did not have our best interests at heart, but were in fact exceedingly deceitful. And those are the entities uh, that are still in play today. And you mentioned the coalescence of the occult science and art. Well, this isn't anything new. The occult science and art have always been innately intertwined. They go together. They always have. Once you probe deep enough into physics, when you begin to probe deep enough into chemistry, when you begin to probe deep enough into astrophysics and all these different scientific realms... Well, what you encounter is what people might refer to as a veil. You encounter this, this world, this realm that is so different from what we know. Some people might call it the spiritual realm. Um, some, some people might call it the metaphysical realm. That's probably the most appropriate term since that's a term that scientists had been using for, for, for ages. Is that, there's this, there, that you use the science of the physical... The purpose of the science of the physical was to be able to reach the metaphysical, to get in contact with the metaphysical, trying to understand the way that the mechanisms of the physical world interact. The grand desire behind that is to be able to penetrate into the metaphysical realm, because uh, the true controllers of knowledge on this planet understand, and of history, by the way, understand that knowledge came from the gods. They understand that, and they understand that knowledge was lost. Much of our knowledge was lost, and, and one of their great hopes is to recover that knowledge. And so they're using what we consider science, what we consider to be objective, what we consider to be rational, what we consider to be so divorced from anything spiritual, this exalted science, uh, the science of Richard Dawkins, the science that is put so high on a pedestal that uh, we couldn't even hope to aspire to its grandeur uh, unless we went to the Ivy League schools and, and became great scientists ourselves. Well, that science is and always has been a product of forbidden knowledge. And much of it is just bunk to deceive, but at the heart of it, what you have is the teachings of the fallen angels. You have knowledge that is just trickled out from what has been lost, and the true design is to recover. The true goal is to recover that lost knowledge. Speaking of science, and you mentioned astrophysics, even the renowned German theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg, I mean, this guy developed theories of subatomic particles, quantum physics. I mean, he's one smart dude. He pioneered quantum mechanics. So you look at this scientist, why is this guy throwing around terms like Babylon potential? And whether it's these weirdos in these 
very satanic rituals and dances and operas like in Hungary or even at CERN, this weird occult like opera display. Why are these so-called scientists aligning themselves, Tim, with these very esoteric occult practices? Well, it was Werner Heisenberg who insisted that the acronym of CERN carried over to the European Organization for Nuclear Research because it originated from, I won't try to pronounce it, it's a French term, but the French version of European Council for Nuclear Research, the French variation of that, that's where we get the acronym CERN. It doesn't fit the new name of the organization since 1954, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It no longer fits that title, but yet, for some reason, Werner Heisenberg wanted the acronym of CERN to remain. And we can only speculate why. And you mentioned earlier the connection to Celtic deities. Um, there's an entity called Cernunos, and he's called CERN for short sometimes. And Cernunos was the god of the underworld, the god of death and rebirth, of, of destruction and reconstitution. And so we can only, again, we can only speculate that Werner Heisenberg understood that uh, when you get deep enough into quantum physics, and I believe uh, uh, Albert Einstein also understood, when you get deep enough into quantum physics, you're penetrating, you're leaving the physical and you're entering the metaphysical. You just are. Whether you want to or not, whether you believe it or not, it makes no difference. When you start talking about spooky action at a distance, as Albert Einstein coined it, talking about the interaction uh, between particles on a quantum level, and we won't venture too deeply into that science because I can't claim to truly understand it. And I don't really believe anybody truly can. Because, you, again, you're dealing with something that is more metaphysical than physical. And by the way, when you talk about the metaphysical and the physical, the spiritual and the, and the natural, the supernatural and the natural, the spiritual um, and the material, you're not dealing with two divorced realities. These are not divorced realities. These are two sides of the same coin. That's something that it's, it's, it's fundamental to understand that uh, the, the spiritual is not divorced from the physical. It is absolutely intertwined with it. It is connected to it. And one leads to the other inevitably. And so, again, when you dig deep enough in the physical world, you discover the metaphysical inevitably, invariably. That's what you're going to encounter. And the great scientific minds, they encounter this reality. And it's hard for them to deal with. That's why the, the whole issue about quantum physics, that's why these, these scientists who are physicists, they can't stand when lay people like us talk about quantum physics. You know why? Because they themselves can't really understand it. <laughs> and so when we begin to talk about quantum physics and relate it to the metaphysical world, the spiritual world, they absolutely detest that because they have no explanation for when they penetrate that deeply into physics, there's, you can't really explain things anymore in a conventional way. And that's exactly the way that things are, are, are put together. That's the way our universe is put together. They are two sides of the same coin. You cannot operate in one realm without affecting the other. There, we, we, as a human race, uh, as sons and daughters of, of Adam and Eve, because of the fall, I believe, we have been, for our own protection... We've been dumbed down, if you will. We've, I think we've had some of those sensory faculties that are able to penetrate into the metaphysical. They've been turned off or turned down, again, for our own protection. And so we're naturally equipped to understand and to deal with the reality of that two-sided coin, the physical and the metaphysical, if that makes any sense. Well, when you look at what this machine does and how it accelerates proton beams to a velocity just under the speed of light, when you take a culmination, as you said a great word earlier, a coalescence of really what all this harnessing of this power is, I mean, when you're essentially unleashing subatomic secrets of matter, what are the overreaching implications? Because, I mean, you can't, once you open Pandora's box, you cross a threshold, you can't undo that. So it's pretty arrogant for these guys to think they can do what they're about to do, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. But they have a confidence. See, they have the confidence of occultic prophecy. They are bolstered by the promises of ancient times, the promises uh, of the golden age, the reemergence of the golden age, and the reappearance of the gods that's what they're trying to bring about. That's what they're trying to catalyze. And 
uh, again, regardless, forget about whatever the intentions of the scientists at CERN may be. Uh, as much as people would like to deny this, the fact is that they're irrelevant. It is irrelevant what the director of CERN wants to accomplish with CERN. All they are are the tools. They're uncovering the science. They're building the mechanisms that their benefactors are going to use ultimately for whatever designs they desire, just like Hitler with the real one and or the V1 and V2 rocket program that he had running. The fact is that these guys are building essentially in the Large Hadron Collider. They're building and they have built and they're continuing to build and to make modifications. It's a work in progress. They're constructing a machine that is going to be able, that is going to bring about, that is going to make feasible weapons of war that are destructive on a scale that we can't even imagine. Atomic weapons, we're in the atomic age, we have been ever since the end of World War II. Well, these weapons that they're, that they're, they're not constructing them at CERN, they're bringing about the pieces together that are going again to allow these, these weapons to be feasible. Um, let me give you an example. Antimatter. Antimatter, a lot of lay people still believe is fiction. Physicists know that it's not. But a lot of lay people think it's fiction because it was, a, it was a, again, used in Star Wars. I don't know if it was used in Star Trek, but it was a big part of the physics, the fictional physics behind Star Wars, which turned out to be true. Antimatter is not theoretical. Uh, not only can we measure it, but we can contain it in the LHC, in the Large Hadron Collider. And that's significant because antimatter has ex enormous explosive potential. A quarter gram of antimatter can produce an explosive yield equivalent to five kilotons of TNT. Now, we're talking about atomic level explosions without residual nuclear fallout. Right now, of course, the problem is if you're, in, if you're, for example, China and you want to invade the United States and first invading, let's say, Washington, D.C., well, if you nuke it, you're screwing yourself because you can't then move in and take over and, and, and make any use of the land uh, of the territory that you invaded because, I mean, you radiated it and it's going to be useless for a long period of time. That's one of the reasons why nobody uses strategic nuclear weapons. We use tactical nukes, but we don't use strategic nukes, the kind that can build, blow up large cities, because we ruin the real estate that we, you know, that we blow up. I mean, it becomes useless to us for extended periods of time. But antimatter, anti, and I'm not going to even try to explain what antimatter is. I barely understand it myself. But antimatter is capable of creating those atomic level explosions um, without a lot of the problems that nuclear, thermal nuclear bombs and w warheads create. And that's, and antimatter isn't even the worst of it. There's something called strangelets. I mean, we're dealing with time distortion, stargates, particle beam weapons, black holes, which I think are theoretical. I don't think they really exist, but also DNA sequencing, artificial synthesis, and a host of other technologies that are being advanced and developed because of the activity that's happening not only at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, um, resulting from the what we're finding out, what we're discovering, what we're unraveling at all the different collider facilities around the world. And uh, to make a long story short here, basically I believe it is my postulation that the controllers behind the scenes are trying to develop the weapons with which to make war on entities far more powerful than human beings. That's one of the main, in my opinion, one of the main occult conspiracies afoot here. You know, I was thinking as you were talking about God's intervention at the Tower of Babel, I mean, that delayed the hellish plans there. But I mean, really, Tim, the Luciferian elite now control major financial, political, religious circles of the world, and they're controlling these systems as if that isn't bad enough. But when you look at the labors of Mystery Babylon, they've been sort of quietly planning and waiting for thousands of years for the releasing of the Watchers of Genesis 6. And so if they're armed with developing Watcher technology, you know, you have elites using transhumanism and mind control. I mean, what are they building here? The Joel chapter two army of the Antichrist? Because when you have a culmination of Mark of the Beast technology and our DNA being affected at a molecular level, it's almost like this is all culminating to one massive event, isn't it? It is. 
And um, I believe it's encapsulated in Psalm 2, the first few verses of Psalm 2, which read, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Now this, this that was uh, Psalm 2, verses 1 through um, 6. This, this, these verses have perplexed me since I was a, a teenager. Because what apparently we have here is we have the rulers of the earth, the kings and the rulers of the earth, taking counsel, plotting against God. Plotting against the Lord and his anointed. That's a capital A. In other words, the Father and his Son. Plotting against God and his Son, Jesus. And that's astounding to me and always has been. Because you have to assume a few things here. And I believe this is absolutely prophetic. I don't believe that this refers to anything less than the human race plotting to make war with God at the end of the age. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that we have to ask ourselves and realize here. Number one, it's apparent that the kings of the earth, the rulers that are taking counsel together, that are plotting against the Lord, are aware of who he is. And furthermore, they're aware of who his anointed one is. In other words, his son, Jesus. And that's a very important statement because that means that they're aware of Jesus' rightful claim to sit on the throne, to occupy that throne, and to govern the earth. That's why um, the Lord says here in, in verse 6, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So this gives us an insight into what they're plotting. They're plotting to set their king on the, on the throne that belongs to the Son of God, who is also the Son of Man, Jesus. They're plotting to usurp the throne of Jesus on this planet. So that tells you again that they know who the Lord is and who his anointed is. So we're not dealing with a cabal of atheistic individuals. We're dealing with Luciferians who know who their enemy is. And unfortunately for them, their enemy is God Almighty. That's what they're plotting. That's what they're planning. That's the futile thing that they've conceived in their minds. That's the vain thing uh, that the Lord is laughing at. Now, here's the next question. See, here's the question that, that, that absolutely perplexed me, as I said, for so many years. What kind of weapons do you bring to a war with God? What kind of weapons? I mean, what man would ever believe, would ever assume that he could or pretend that he could do damage to God with even atomic weapons. I mean, it's preposterous. So something is giving the human race, the rulers, the kings of the earth who are setting themselves against the Lord, something is giving them the confidence that they can make war with God and with his anointed, knowing full well who he is. They believe that they can make war with him. What is giving them this confidence? Well, there's two things, in my opinion. Number one, it's those whom they are following that are giving them that confidence. They're not following human leaders. They're following the gods of the ancient world. They're following those who would claim to be the liberators of mankind, who are going to convince the human race that we need to throw off the shackles, break the bonds, cast away the cords of this entity who has made himself God over the human race. That's the Luciferian creed. That's the first thing. The second thing is, so they're following the leadership, which is not human. The second thing is, they've got the weapons of war that they believe are powerful enough to reach even into the metaphysical world and shake, shake the, the spiritual realm. And I think that that is part of what Nimrod was doing with the Tower of Babel. This is what Tom Horn refers to as the Babylon Potential to open a gate, possibly to assault heaven. Who knows what they were planning? What was their end game? They were definitely trying, in my opinion, and based on other people's research and my own research, they were trying to open the gates for these entities to come 
to lead them in this war against God. This ludicrous, futile war against God. This is the prophetic future of this planet. And there is, in my mind, and I believe in accordance with Scripture, there is no doubt about it. Mankind is going to rise with such hubris that he will actually believe and conspire to make war with God. Well, you and I have talked about these Blavatsky's and Alice Bailey and these other Satanists and Luciferians that are obsessed with opening portals. Crowley opened something. Scripture does make it clear to him that Apollo comes up out of the pit and he's the king over the bottomless hip, but it doesn't explicitly state that he comes out at the same time as the literal opening of the pit. So this could be what we're looking at, couldn't it be? Yes, and, and again, it's important for people to understand that these guys, and when I say these guys, let's just call them the Luciferians, the Luciferian elite, uh, behind the scientists at CERN. The scientists at CERN are oblivious to all of this. They, 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 they are. They would laugh at us talking about this right now. But behind those guys, behind the technology, behind the, the, the funders, the ones who are behind the United Nations, for example, and the European Union, these are the guys that, that are absolutely convinced and believe that the entities that they're that they're inviting back, that they're loosing, that they're that they're that they want to reconstitute and and to resurrect and bring back into the world, these aren't demonic, ugly creatures. These aren't the kind of creatures that are described in the book of Revelations. These aren't the the monsters um, that we're familiar with when we read the book of Revelations. To them, these again, these are the gods. These are the ones who freed mankind. These are the allies of their liege lord, Lucifer. These are the, the beautiful beings that are, that are the, the, the beings that, that inspired civilization and humanity. Um, that's the way that they see it. And indeed, uh, these entities probably, some of them at least, do have the appearance of benevolence and, and beauty. Um, but they're completely deceived. So they're, they, in their minds, they, they are for humanity. The, these Luciferian elite, they, they believe that they are the true defenders of humanity. They believe that they are the, the benevolent faction and that we're the evil ones. We're the ones who are for oppression. We're the ones who are for the enslavement of mankind. It's completely reversed, even though they, in order to make contact with these entities and have fellowship with them, intercourse with them, they sacrifice small children, and they do, as grotesque as it sounds, they do. They drink blood. They perform all of these wicked sacraments in order to get in contact with these supposedly benevolent beings. But it's, it's the pride. It blinds them. And these are the people who are, are holding the cards. Uh, they are the power brokers operating under the dominion of Satan. And... Uh, people always will respond and comment on my videos and, and, and send me emails saying, yes, but, but God's still in control. Of course he is. And it's even a comforting thought to consider that the final world leader that's going to arise on the stage of humanity, that it is God who entices the kings, the earthly kings, to give their power to him. So yes, God is in control. But uh, that statement in and of itself doesn't free us, doesn't liberate us from our responsibility to understand the times in which we live and to not be deceived. It has nothing to do with, uh, it, has, it does not bolster, nor does it support the argument that we shouldn't be aware of these things. In fact, the opposite is true. We need to be aware of these things so that we're not deceived, number one. And number two, in a more temporal sense, that uh, we can avoid bodily harm and avoid becoming part of the carnage that's going to ensue on the earth and probably in our lifetime. I'd like to read real quick um, a couple verses from the book of Romans to put this into perspective for people so that they can understand that what, what, what we're talking about here isn't far-fetched. It's actually, it's a principal matter when you read the Bible and you understand what we are as, as a race, the human race, where we come from, how our minds operate, and the baseness and the fallen state uh, that most human beings are operating out of. Romans 18, Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They're suppressing the truth. And then it says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divine nature, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And so what this is saying, what the writer of Romans is telling us, is that every human being innately knows who God is and makes a willful, conscious decision not to glorify him. And either to glorify something else, and the writer of Romans is making a point about idol worship, that they, they turn to idol worship, or to glorify themselves in, in our humanistic in the humanistic society in which we live, to glorify themselves and their own knowledge. It is important, again, I keep saying this over and over and over, it is important and fundamental that we understand that this is the natural state of the human mind. We understand, we know who God is, the fundamental knowledge of who God is. Every single human being innately knows who God is, not only because he's revealed in nature, and is without excuse, by the way, every human being is without excuse, not only because God is revealed in nature, but because the very subatomic constituents of our own bodies come from him. We cannot deny, I mean, every cell of our bodies acknowledges him, and yet the unbelievers simply choose to deny him and to reject him. So that is, it, sh it, it should be of no surprise uh, to us that humanity at the end will, will be led in a war against God, who they know, who they acknowledge, and furthermore acknowledge who his son is. So it's, it's quite an astounding thing. Well, and it's not really that far of a stretch to think that these unsanctioned transmugenic hybrids are going to be all a part of this end time scene. I mean, even look at, you talked about Romans, but you know, look at Daniel talks about 10 rulers, you know, mingling themselves with the seed of men. So the kings that would rule the earth at the end of the age, we could really be talking about this sort of transgenic hybrid concoction, couldn't we? I think we are. And keep in mind that hybrid entities, many of which are among us now, and many of which are yet to be released, um, re again, referring to the CERN opening gates and releasing these things, uh, these entities have no hope of salvation outside of usurping the throne of Christ, taking this planet over and making war with God and somehow wresting power from him and, and establishing their own kingdom. That's their hope. It's their only hope. The, the only other option is to be thrown into, into everlasting torment in, in the lake of fire. That they, they have no other game plan. They have to win. And they have every reason to win. And so th they're, they're very committed. They're very dedicated to this war with God and leading humanity against God. And the human component is very important because God gave authority over the earth to us. Right. And when I say us, I'm not just referring to Christians. I'm referring to our race. Humanity was given authority over the earth. Even though the devil is the prince of the power of the air, even though he controls the nations to degree, to the degree that we give him that authority, because we, it's human kings, uh, who are put into places of power. In fact, God is the one who established that, and He's the one who enforces it. And so we're we are the key. We are the uh, we're, we're the main players in this whole situation. These entities have to use humanity. They have to entice humanity to go along with their plan, uh, uh, to go to war with God, and to give their power, give their authority, the authority that they have, over to the devil and to his Christ. Well, and it's kind of a hard thing to wrap a person's head around, Tim, when you think of the fact that God has not made certain entities. I mean, there, there's entities that exist that God has not sanctioned. They're, they're illegitimate, I guess, if you want to call them illegitimate species, not made by God. And yet these 
Luciferians, they really do take an incredible, they're, they're obsessed with humanities. So there's something about humans that they really take a fascination in, don't they? Yes, these are unsanctioned beings. They're unsanctioned entities. In other words, they were never sanctioned by God to exist. They were never supposed to exist. They're illegal. And of course, we're referring to these entities that came as a result of the sin of angels mingling their seed with the daughters of men, the whole Genesis 6 scenario, which is borne out in almost every major ancient culture on this planet, tells a similar story of the gods coming down and mingling with men. Again, uh, referring to the Golden Age, they see that as the time of great enlightenment and peace and prosperity and the advancement of the human race. But those of us who believe in the Bible, we look back at that time and we see it as a time of great trouble and a time that was so wicked and vile that it it caused God to, to eradicate, to exterminate life on this planet because it was genetically corrupted by these fallen entities. And, and, and unfortunately, the vast majority of Bible-believing Christians have unwittingly rejected the revelance and the realization and the truth of that Genesis 6, 6 narrative. In, in other words, uh, they can't understand what's coming because because they, they can't understand what was. In other words, they can't understand what will be because they can't understand what was. Well, absolutely. And that's a very good ending point because really, you know, as Steve Quayle, our friend, always says, in order to understand the fruit of evil, you have to really understand the root of evil. And that's sort of what we're looking at here. And now tell the listeners, you've got a really good video out on CERN, Tim. You really break this whole thing down Tell the folks where they can find that and also how they can get your True Legends, the documentary film series, episode one, Technology of the Fallen. Well, the video on CERN, the, the analysis I did on CERN can be found on our YouTube channel, which is called Gen 6 Productions. That's G-E-N-S-I-X, one word, Gen 6 Productions. If you even just type in Gen 6 uh, on YouTube, you'll get our You'll see our logo. It's a, it's a number six in the form of a padlock. It says Gen 6. And you click on that channel and you'll see the Elbrino analysis, the one I did on CERN. It's called CERN Occult Conspiracy. You'll see that at the top of, at the, the, the very top of the list of the videos because it was the most recent video that we posted. Um, you can also find the link on stevequail.com. Uh, in, in terms of the True Legends documentary film series, our first episode, episode one, which is entitled Technology of the Fallen, can be purchased in DVD form or rented in, in digital format, streaming format on Vimeo. You can go to truelegendstheseries.com. That's truelegendstheseries.com. And for more information on our, on our documentary film series and also for the links to purchase or to rent the film. Well, I can tell you that I've seen it and it is absolutely fantastic. And I really want to thank you, Tim, for all the work you do. Just brilliant analysis, great work. And it's always really a pleasure to have you on the show. So thank you for coming on the program. And it's always a fascinating and riveting discussion when you come on the program. And it's really a pleasure to have you on and do come back and see us soon. I appreciate you inviting me back. Folks, that was Timothy Alberino from The Alberino Analysis. His information is linked there at the website weekendvigilante.com for today's bio. Do get over and have a look at True Legends, that documentary series, such good stuff. And do sign up for Tim's YouTube channel, amazing information. Just a reminder, do get out to that Augusto Perez event. It's coming up in a month, November 13th, 14th, and 15th. Live Oak, Florida. It is going to be amazing. Trust me. This event, you are not going to want to miss. Light in the darkness, a foreshadowing of his glory. It is going to be such a powerful event and a very powerful move of God. And I do hope that you get out to that. If you are listening to this show today and you need prayer, please do get a hold of me. All my information is linked on my website. And if you're a new listener, shoot me an email and let me know how you like the show. Tomorrow on the program is one of my favorites, always a favorite, Dr. Timothy Ball, geopolitical expert, renowned climatologist, speaks all over the world, and it is such a pleasure for me to have him on tomorrow. Timothy Ball was the one who said Sheila Zielinski's book effectively demolishes 
most of what you think you know. Again, Green Gospel folks, get a copy of Green Gospel. Get some copies out to people. This is such an important book. I cannot stress how important this book is. And I think you're going to be absolutely shocked at the information in this book. Do get your hands on a copy, Green Gospel, The New World Religion at greengospel.ca. And on Friday, one of my favorites, Russ Dizdar. It's always an incredible discussion and such a blessing to have Russ on. It's going to be fantastic. Thank you so much for tuning into the program today. See you tomorrow. Good night and God bless.